This shows you as heavy as I was. How loud are you? About 280. 18 plus percent of our children right now are obese. If you go with the flow in America today, you will end up overweight or obese, as two thirds of Americans do. I don't want to be fat for the rest of my life. I've got diabetes. Sleep apnea. High blood pressure. I get dizzy when I get up. Everything's hurting now. We don't now take this as a really serious, urgent national priority. We are all of us individually and as a nation going to pay a really serious price. Here in the South Bronx, this is the lowest income county in New York State. We have the highest rates of obesity. Uh, and this map is showing in the neighborhood we're in now, uh, more than 30% uh, of the people uh, being obese. Very high uh, prevalence of diabetes. Just a short distance away here in Manhattan, in the Upper East Side, where it's uh, the highest income neighborhood in the city, uh, we have very low prevalence of obesity, very low prevalence of diabetes. Two-thirds of adults citywide are overweight or obese. But in the darkest areas on this map, over close to 90% in some cases of adults are overweight or obese. And you can see in the areas that are lighter around University City, lower rates of obesity. And look at all the healthy food sources. So all the produce carts, the supermarkets, the farmers markets. And when you go back to these areas that have higher rates of obesity, you see many fewer sources of healthy food. There has been a recognition of the seriousness of obesity as an issue for the whole country. But if you look at the, the state of Tennessee in Nashville, which is where, where we're located, it is a crisis level here. I mean, we rank at the bottom. About one out of 10 adults is walking around with diabetes. If you look at people who have not graduated from high school, it's one out of five. The red spots in this particular map are the, where the, the highest rates of, of, of poverty are. We know that in this area, almost one out of every three children is considered to be overweight or uh, wow. obese. And this is an area, as you were saying, with poverty. The average household income is less than $25,000 for a family of four. Orange County, California is an extremely wealthy county, one of the wealthiest counties in the United States. Orange County has a very high number of parks and park space. In fact, per 1,000 residents in Orange County, there are 41 acres of parks and open space, but not in Santa Ana. This red circle reflects the proportion of kids that are overweight or obese. Look at the difference between that circle and this tiny little circle in Irvine. And all of this yellow, which reflects relatively high rates of wealth, right next door to these deep pockets of poverty, overweight, and obesity. So what is happening here is that we have data that can document that not everybody has the same resources to fight diseases. And at the end, the epidemics are reduced to the pockets of poverty. I want to take the committee on a, a, just a very brief journey from the uh, perspective of a local public health practitioner. So the death certificate is actually a pretty good source of data. You can tell what somebody died of. You can tell what age they were when they died. 
you can tell what their race ethnicity is, and you can tell where they lived. And those four pieces of data can tell you a lot about patterns of death in a community. Where you live matters, and it matters a lot. Another way of putting this is, does your zip code matter more than your genetic code? This is Baltimore, Maryland, where they have a census tract down uh, near the Inner Harbor with a life expectancy of 62 years, and another life expectancy up in northern Baltimore, 82 years, a 20-year life expectancy difference. This is Cuyahoga County, Cleveland, where we thus far have found the greatest disparity in, in life expectancy. This is Huff, an inner city neighborhood with the average life expectancy of 64 years. And eight miles down the road is Lyndhurst with a life expectancy of close to 90 years. Understanding what drives that disparity is going to help us understand what is driving the chronic disease epidemic. It's going to help us understand the tools and strategies to get underneath the obesity epidemic. Obesity is the primary driver of chronic disease, a big contributor to diabetes, cardiovascular disease, stroke, and some cancers. And so with our healthcare costs at over $2 trillion, our nation's costs are enormous. In the low-income neighborhood, there's a different food environment. Not only do people make less money, they're surrounded by lower quality food, it's difficult to get fresh vegetables, and they're more stressed. And so it brings up this question of what degree of free will do people really have when they're in a certain controlled environment? And until we can understand that there are large social and economic forces that predict obesity, we're never gonna solve the epidemic. There is a design, there is an urban design that is making people sick. There is an urban design that is making people obese, overweight. There is a design that is making people develop chronic diseases. There's no healthy places in my neighborhood. The most that we have is like Chinese, McDonald's, uh, KFC. With all the burger joints and deals and 99 cent this, and it's 99 cent everywhere. If I have $3, you go buy two burgers for 99 cents each and a soda. For us, it's more accessible to go to the fast food. I got a family of five kids, and it's hard to just do it on the cheap food, you know? There's limited resources. I'm gonna pick what I can afford to feed my family. You know, to get to the grocery store and to find the healthier foods, then to have to prepare those foods and, and the expense, it's almost out of the picture for someone in my situation. If you are uh, confined to living in a particular neighborhood because of the amount of money that you make, obviously the choices that are in that neighborhood are, are gonna be your only choices, so. The same populations where people have food insecurity, where people worry about where they're gonna have the money to get their next meal, are the same populations where we're seeing the highest obesity rates. I may live in a community, if I'm low income in this country, where there are food deserts, where there aren't amenities that give me access to fresh vegetables, fruits, and other high quality foods. And the streets that I may want to go exercise on may be crime ridden. There may be cars or freeways or there may not be parks. So here I am trying to exercise personal responsibility and I can't be healthy. So if they ever tell you you don't have any options for eating, well, you, sh you should definitely come to my neighborhood because you have the McDonald's right there. You have the Subway, fried chicken. Then you can go get a coffee or a donut, Dunkin' Donuts. If you're still hungry, you can go to the Wendy's right there. 
This is junk food heaven. When you see food, even pictures of food, it makes you feel hungry. In poor neighborhoods, there are many more posters and billboards and, you know, outdoor advertising for food that you don't see in wealthy neighborhoods. People here have two or three jobs to pay the rent, to pay for a metro car. You know, they don't have time to cook home. In a low-income neighborhood, there are more convenience stores. In fact, two to four times as many small convenience stores that predominantly sell foods that are high in sugar, fat, salt. Hello. How are you? Go into a poor neighborhood anywhere in America, in a small store, what do you see there? Chips, soda, candy. These are products that are made from sugar, uh, they're made from wheat, they're made from corn, and they have an enormous shelf life, uh, a year or more. These are products that have a very large profit margin. You see, this is my downfall right here. The honey buns, two for a dollar. Cheap calories are unhealthy calories. You can easily, in Bodega in the South Bronx, get 1,300 calories for a little more than $2. You can get more than you need for an entire day for less than $3. Two liters soda, you might get a special offer of 99 cents. And the water, why is it more expensive? We can't really make a dent in the obesity epidemic if we don't start making a dent in the disparities between the low-income and the high-income communities. We have to understand that in a very low-income community, there are much more profound challenges, and we have a much greater obligation as a society to create changes in that environment. There's a societal, not just responsibility, but I think investment issue here. Um, because everyone benefits from everyone else being healthy. The more people are unhealthy, that's less economic productivity, it's more health care costs, a variety of other costs that everyone has to take on. What type of nation can live without a workforce that is healthy? So what diabetes and obesity is doing to this nation is crippling the workforce. But beyond that, crippling the families, and the individuals and the communities. We are a city with a high population density, uh, and so there are mobile vendors all over the city, and there are more people who want to vend than there are available permits. And so we said we could take advantage of that. Um, what came out of that was the idea of the green cards. What we did was we raised the cap on the total number of mobile vendors in the city, but only for vendors who were willing to sell fresh fruits and vegetables according to our specifications, and only if they sold them in underserved neighborhoods. People are strolling by, they're seeing this healthy food here, and that competes with all the advertising you're seeing for junk food. All my customers come every day, every day. My strawberries, the number one seller is strawberries. Everybody loves strawberries. It's not too expensive, it's cheap, and it's fresh. That's, that's the best part, it's very fresh. This doesn't last in my house. We eat yeah, like two bags a day. Oh, can I have some cherries? The biggest changes in health will happen by us creating a world where people naturally behave in a healthier way. Thank you. Okay, bye kids. I am responsible for a city of 8.3 million people. Every one of those people I consider to be my patient as a doctor. Um, and of all the health problems I deal with, this is the one problem that's getting worse, uh, obesity and diabetes. We haven't solved it yet. There's a lot of things we're working on here. Uh, each one I think can contribute to the solution, but we haven't reversed it yet. And so our I'm always trying to understand better the nature of the problem and trying to see where is the leverage, where can we make changes uh, that can really turn things around. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Good to see you. Thank you. 
have issues of poverty, certainly of crime, uh, but also lack of options. And so then you get a proliferation of bad options. Yeah, that's a yeah. small market. Decide and see what kind well, of. They're mostly about mobile phones. Yeah, I don't think they have too much food. It's a... So they sell water, <laughs> sugar sweetened beverages, and hot dogs. Where would you buy a salad? Along here? here? Yeah. Uh, um, I don't think you would. So, uh, food choices. Okay. Chinese store. Right. Right. And jumbo steaks. That would be it. Yeah. See the yellow thing? All the yellow. Yeah. yeah. It's really interesting. And all the way down too. So folks are bombarded, and right. this is all you have. There's nothing else to buy, yeah, right. nothing else right. to buy. If you don't have a car, yeah. and there's no big market right in your neighborhood, I mean, <laughs> how many groceries can you carry on the trolley? In many neighborhoods in Philadelphia, unfortunately, you, ha you literally do have what we refer to as these food deserts. And so the, uh, the alternative, I'll go to the store, you know, two blocks down the street, unhealthy products, prices too high, limited choices, and I'll just deal with it. And the outcome is bad health. I've got uh, two bananas and an apple. One twenty-five. If you're in this area, this bag is twenty-five cents. If you go to City Line Avenue in a vending machine, this bag will be seventy-five cents on up, and it won't be marked twenty-five cents. So it starts with the, the company. And right. They charge a little more in the neighborhoods where they can Get make up more. for the cost, and right. they keep it cheap here yeah. and move product. Is there anything that you're able to sell that's on Healthy. the healthier side that competes price-wise with this? No, not at all. For 25 cents, nothing. Mm -hmm. Kids, they know no vegetable or fruits. You know, they may know apples and oranges, but I mean, I tell you, I had a kid the other day I was eating in here, and he asked me what that was. It was I was eating broccoli, fresh broccoli, you know, raw broccoli, dipping it. Some of the kids are raised on this stuff. It's chips, candy, soda. You know, this is a big part of these kids' diet. And you can see it reflects in their waistline. Every community may not be able to have a supermarket, but we want to work with the stores that are already in neighborhoods to help them sell healthy products. We've had a great response. No, it's just really, really great. I mean, we're I'm very sure. excited. I wanted to comment on these labels because yeah. this is actually this is a traffic light. Right. right. Assemble something really right. easy for people. Yeah, they can right. just look at right. the colors, right. go. Especially easy for kids to remember. Yeah. I got married and moved into this community in 1973. When I moved here, I realized that there was no supermarket. When you talk to people and say, I don't have a supermarket in my area, Oh my God, well, where do you go? I did not want to move. I just wanted to make a difference and I wanted to make a change. They made this happen. Uh, and they pushed the political community, they pushed their neighbors, they pushed uh, the uh, business community and convinced folks that this could not only happen, but work. All of us on our time, volunteering, struggling, blood, sweat, and tears to make this happen. This used to be barren land, weed overgrown, concrete, debris, short dumping, all kinds of stuff going on here. Uh, and uh, over the course of about a year and a half, uh, this entire section was transformed into what we see now. Brand new supermarket. They haven't had a supermarket in this community in 30 years. All righty. Okay. We are shopping. I have to get some broccoli. Broccoli. Broccoli's, broccoli's down, down here. Yes. 
So then we, we are doing collard greens. It's like heaven. I can come up here and get fresh vegetables. It's marvelous. <laughs> it's convenient. Market mean everything for this neighborhood. <laughs> Having the tools and resources right here in the community, that's when you're making progress. Exactly what I'm looking for. To watch this entire community transform itself was just, it really was incredible. I've never seen anything like it. It's the best project I've ever been involved in in my life. Yeah, I know, <laughs> I know. There are many small programs at different levels that we can use to chip away at the problem over time. Step by step, we'll put in place systems and interventions that'll make it easier for people to be physically active, and we'll change our food environment in ways so that people eat healthier. We need more people to participate in decisions that are being made about investing in open space and parks, investing in grocery stores, farmers markets, and education of our kids around healthy eating and healthy diets. I'm one of those people who believes we can reverse this trend. And we do that not as individuals, we do that together with other people in communities.